Willie D Live. It's Willie D, y'all. Back with another episode of information and instructions to help you navigate through this wild, crazy, beautiful world. In the studio, Robert T. Say, can I, can I say your whole name? Robert T. Turner. Ta- call me Robert T. Robert Turner. Is your okay, name. I know your name. You know I know your name. Yeah. yeah you know I know your name, man. Right? <laughs> How long? <laughs> yeah. Robert T. Turner is in the building, fam. Um, this This guy right here is one of those guys who uh, anytime you talk to him, you got to learn something. I've been knowing you for how long? How long have we known you? Like 15, 20 years now? 30 years, it's I been, guess. It's been, 20, it's, been, it's been a while. A long, but, but, a long, every, long. but every time I talk to you, man, I, I, it seems like I learned something uh, new and I always, uh, I'm always inspired. And, and, and where do you get this ability to inspire from because it don't matter you know what i'm going through whatever man you you know you be you start talking man and you got you gonna laugh about something you got you find a laugh you find <laughs> laughter in everything well i try to stay relaxed yeah and uh i basically you know design my activity around me i'm my number one fan uh-huh so i constantly understand me check myself on a daily basis, 24-7, all day. Yeah. Because uh, I want to be fair toward myself in order to be able to recognize the fact that I'm fair to others. Uh. And that's the way I roll. Uh. <laughs> Rolling like that. And I didn't know. I, I, I knew you was up there, but I didn't know you was 90, bro. That's yeah. the 90 I want, man. I want that kind of 90. Well, That's a good 90 right there. Keep on saying good morning. Keep on saying good morning. <laughs> <laughs> keep waking up. Yeah, keep waking man, up. Man, you you, re- you know, a lot of times you hear people say, man, he had seen it all, done it all. I almost want to say, I know you seem like you've seen it all, done it all, d- done done everything, man, but die. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Well, <laughs> it's going how you look at it. Yeah. I look at it. My mission, what I want to do, how I want to do it, and who I want to do it with, and what boundaries do I have in order to execute my thinking. And uh, when I come to the conclusion that I'm satisfied with me, then that puts me in a position where I can be satisfied with others. Mm. But uh, if I'm not satisfied with myself, I'm being unfair to others if I try to judge them. Yeah, you, you work with a lot of a lot of famous people. You've worked with a lot of famous people. You've been friends with a lot of famous people. Uh, let's talk about Lil Flip. You know, mm-hmm. that Lil Flip, you represented Lil Flip. You was an agent for Lil Flip for some time, True. right? I right? took I took him, uh, I forget the boy, the hump, a boy we hump. call Hump, yeah. friend now. Well, some kind of way, Flip's daddy and I knew each other, but I didn't know Flip. And matter of fact, I didn't even know who he was because I was in the blues, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, one day, his, I met his dad, and his dad asked me, told me he wanted me to meet his son. So I met him, and that's where it started, you know, from there. And for like, Two and a half, three years, Flip was the hottest artist in the country. This was after Flip left uh, Sucker Free yeah. Entertainment, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right after that. And uh, he uh, was number one and two in the world. And when, and when uh, while we was together, you know, mm-hmm. and I had him on the uh, Grammys as a presenter with Kelly Clarkston. The chick out of it's Dallas? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They, they presented the uh, Grammy to uh, Kenny Shesnick. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's the way it started, you know? Yeah. And every year they'd come from Japan to my office and uh, do a segment on for, them for three years. They did it three years in a row. And he was on the cover 
all the music magazines around the world. Folks, I, I was intending to bring those uh, magazines and show them to you. Mm -hmm. I got a, it was three major magazines in Japan that uh, he was on the cover. It's just, we had a good relationship. It was just a thing where time out is time out. You know, I was going up a variety of different ways and doing a bunch of things. And uh, I had a commitment to several different other people that I was doing things with. And in order to be fair to myself and the artists, I just backed off. Mm. You know? And that was the extent of it, really. So when you were working with Flip, uh, what was the the biggest uh, venue that y'all played? Uh, uh, I forget, the uh, MGM. I forget the name of the hall that they call it mm -hmm. in Vegas. He played right. Vegas several times. And... Uh, the Grammys, he did a thing, you know. But all the major, but most of the major halls, he, you know, and he did, we used to do that thing in Atlanta every year, that outdoor festival they got, that real, that big festival they have every year in Atlanta. We did that two years in a row. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, basically, man, it's been a while. You know, I can't remember all the different places, yeah. but yeah. Was Flip the first? Uh, uh, was he the first rapper that you worked with? Yeah, he's the first rapper that I worked did with. Did you have some, you know, trepidation about working with a rapper at first? Like, did you have? Not really. Not really. See, because uh, I'm not a judge of people. Mm -hmm. I don't try to judge the individual. I don't give a shit about what they do. That's their business. It's their privileges, you know? I try to keep my boundaries and my thing, you understand? I try to stay on top of me. And once I feel comfortable with me, they help with what somebody else think. Mm. It's their privilege. How can I deny you your rights and your privileges by telling you what you can't do and can do? But you know what? That, that's a that's a testament of your force, foresight, also, though, because you know that the, the if you typically take uh, an agent or uh, anybody who 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 generally works with a specific genre of music, or uh, like you typically would work with R and B artists, you work with blues artists, you work mm -hmm. with jazz artists, you know, hip hop, brand new generation, years apart. Mm. And and here you are working with, you know, one of the guys who is, uh, you know, in his own right, starting to redefine, you know, what the game looks like, you know, what hip hop looks like. And you right there again, Robert T got his hands in the mix. Robert, <laughs> <laughs> Robert, T, Robert T keeps his pulse on the community, keeps his pulse on what's going on, always in the mix. Like, you played basketball with Marvin Gaye, bro. Yeah. Like, Ralph, how cool is that? Me and Ralph Cooper. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> Ralph Cooper. Shouts out to Ralph Cooper. Oh, yeah. Ralph, Ralph, Ralph didn't, didn't believe me. You know, Ralph used to come by the office every day. Yeah. I said, Ralph, I said, you want to play some bas play some ball? He said, man, I ain't got time, really. So he, I said, I'm going over to, uh, to, to University of Houston over there to the Y. I'm going to meet uh, Marvin Gill with that. We're going to play. We, if, yeah, I said, wherever we had around the country, and we run into each other, I said, we always go somewhere and play basketball, one-on-one, -on -one, me and him. He said, who? <laughs> I said, Marvin Gill. I said, he be here in a little while. I said, I, and, uh, I said you want to go? He said, yeah, I want to go. So Raph and I rode over to the Wide together. Well, Marvin wasn't there when we got there. And uh, I know he was uncomfortable with, you know, the situation because uh, he knew me, but he didn't know me that well. You know, Marvin knew me real well, but Ralph, you know, we communicate, but we weren't what you would call buddy-buddy. 
uh, either hang out together, you understand know me, like sometimes you and I have done, you know. But uh, he, he he was a little, I could see a little doubt there, you know, Bob and Gay coming to play basketball with Robert T. <laughs> yeah. you know? So about five minutes after we got there, five, ten minutes after we got there, Mom and Grandma drove up. And uh, we played ball. I introduced him to Ralph. And we played ball like we normally do. James Brown, we used to do the same thing. Whenever we'd be on tour or something with the guys or wherever I go when they was on tour, I, we'd go and play basketball somewhere at the Y or some university or something, you know, that was, uh, you know, that was accommodating. We, you, you know, everybody, when you tell them you got certain people coming in, but everybody want a piece of it, you know, everybody, you know, but uh, what I used to do, I had a group of people that I dealt with around the country, and I kept it with no boundaries, you know, I always gave them first choice, you know, mm -hmm. and that way, I, I, was, I was in on a lot of things. You take just like Albert Collins, when the uh, president, when the president said uh, he's gonna have the uh, barbecue on the lawn. You remember that? Yeah, when he was joking, about, you talking about when he was joking about the first black president having the barbecue on the lawn? No, no, I'm talking about Kennedy. And what happened? The barbecue that they had on the lawn of the uh, White House. Remember, the, he, he had the barbecue. I missed that. That happened for real? Yeah, I put the uh, entertainment together. Albert Collins was on there. Yeah, man. See, that's what I mean. You keep your hand you're like, like in the mix. Yeah. You stay in know. the mix. See, everybody know a Robert T. Like, somebody know. I ain't saying that they reached the... the, the the stature of, of Robert T. But everybody know that guy that's always in the mix, got his hands in something, and getting money. Getting to <laughs> that money. Like, you are really good at that. Uh, that, I don't, I bet you there ain't too many people that's been around you that ain't made money with you. Well, I never booked a loser so far. I took Johnny Copeland from uh, the matinee to Wall Street, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I came and got here. Now this is going to blow your mind. Johnny Copeland, we go back 1963 when I met him. I was his agent, and as a matter of fact, I'm an agent through the American Federation of Musicians, 7210. That's my number, mm -hmm. and uh, we got to be friends. And we used to get out in his yard. This was back six, 1963. And that tomb, down on bending knees. We used to be out in the yard messing with that tomb, he and I. Till we got it, that we were basically satisfied with it. And he recorded it with a record, oh, no, no name company, but it was Charlie Booth was the uh, representative for us. And uh, that's what uh, got Johnny the ruler, down on bending knees. And from that, we went to the Grammys. We won the Grammy in 85. Yeah, when he, he put out that, that, yeah, that album. What's that yeah. album called? Some, Showdown. Show, show, Showdown. Showdown. Yeah, him and Alligator that, Records. Yeah, him and yeah. Albert Collins, yeah. Robert Cray, and Johnny Copeland. We and were, you, you put that trio together. Yeah. You put that play together. Uh, well, I'm, uh, you know, Johnny was the key, and Albert was the key. And we got Robert to go, you know, to get involved. Mm -hmm. So it was, I was a portion of it. I had to, you know, the last word on Johnny. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, what I did, I met some boys in New York, youngsters, two white boys, about 22, 23 years old, maybe, at the most. But... They was out there in the middle of the mix with that entertainment, and they love the blues. And I'm living in New York at the time, and uh, I come to Houston. I said, Johnny, I said, I got some boys that's real aggressive, and they love blues. I said, I'm going to hook you up with them. He said, okay, well, where they going? I, I said, they in New York. 
He said, well, what you going to, how we going to, how we going to do it? I said, you going to New York? He said, move to New York? I said, yeah, you move to New York. <laughs> he looked at me and said, oh, man. I took his clothes, put them in the car, and I said, you come to New York to get them. Hmm. And he, 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 he cussed me all the way to Atlanta. <laughs> So, so he drove, yeah, drove to... Yeah, to, I picked him up, put all yeah. the clothes in the car, and told him to come to New York to get him if you wasn't going. Was that your first time staying in New York, living in New York? No, I was in New York back in the 50s. The 50s. But you, 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 you were born in Bourbon, Mississippi, though, right? Right. And then you were raised in Gary, Indiana. Gary, Indiana. From three and, years old till I left, went to the military. Right. Okay. Uh, it was Gary. You went to the military and you were what? What branch? Air Force. I was in the Air Force. What'd you do? For crash rescue. Crash rescue? Mm-hmm. Ah. That's yeah. dangerous. <laughs> 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 so, so, yeah, yeah. You didn't pick, because, you, pick, cause he, you know, crash res rescue, hell, you can find yourself needing to be rescued. Oh, hey, what are you talking about? You put yeah. it on the line every time. Yeah. You take, like, think about it, one of those F-16s, loaded. When I say loaded, full of, full of, full of all the weapons and everything. Mm -hmm. Picture one of those come in on the emergency. Mm. And don't even mention the crash. I mean, that's, that's inhumane, the crash part, because you got all these weapons and, things and everything here, and you got to figure out how to get that pilot out of there. And, that, the, and the guns, you set, up, you set up and the guns are like this. So you got, to, you got a line here where you got to go through to get to the... the the, the pilot, you know, say the wing or the, you know, wherever, he, wherever they, with the co-pilot in the, in the, uh, with the bucket seat, we used to call it. Mm -hmm. But uh, you got to set up properly on that in order to go in there because those things start going off when they heat up. Yeah. Now, this, is this World War II or Vietnam War? No, no, this was... Well, which one was the Korean, uh, Korean conflict? War. The Korean. Korean, Korean conflict. conflict. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, you really, it's real strategic, you know. You have to be on top of what you're doing. And 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 the way we would practice, and every day we would practice. And we would go like they had a, a pit, say, big as this lot. And, uh, Set it on fire, and you got to put it out, <laughs> mm -hmm. and you got to figure out how to get in there and how to set up, because you got these trucks. You understand me? They set up in certain spots. Each one got a designated spot that they set up, and there's no room for error. Did you ever put, find yourself in a position where you had to kill somebody? No. Huh? Mm -mm. No, no, I never, as far as uh, the Air Force don't do any, any violence is not really, you know, in that manner, they don't tolerate that. The Air Force do that long distance violence. Yeah, yeah, we. <laughs> Dropping bombs <laughs> and shooting them. <laughs> yeah, well, we didn't, then, we didn't yeah. Uh, go to that combat, you know. Yeah. And uh, we, used to, we used to tease the uh, soldiers, you know. Sometimes we'd be in different TDY, different places, you know. And we used to tease them. They'd, they'd be sleeping in the, in the area, and we'd be sleeping in the bunks in the hotel and things. You know, we used mm -hmm. to mess with them, you know. But uh, that's just the way it was. But it was just a thing between the guys, you know. It wasn't nothing really serious because uh, everybody knew what their responsibilities were. And what they had to do and what they must do. How, no, how, how were you treated when you came back to the U.S.? Did, uh, you feel, yeah. did you feel like your sacrifices that you made 
were were worth it? Did you feel like it was it was it was appreciated when you came back? Well, I don't have no qualms. I, if I had to do it all over again, I'd do it. Okay. Because uh, I enjoyed every moment of it. And uh, I, it put me in a position where I had a comparison. I could p compare the different forms of services. See, the Air Force is very strategic, and there's certain things, certain ways. And the Army, Marines, Navy, they all, you understand me, have their certain rules and regulations, but the operators want. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so amazing about it. It operates as one. And that's, and, and that's why I guess they say military. <laughs> I guess that's where the word came from, I guess. I don't know. When you got back to, to the States, where'd you find employment? Say that again. Where did you find employment when you got back to the States after the war? Well, I went back to school. Okay. When I got out, I went to school, and the uh, military was taking care of, you know. And you, my, went, you went to school? And, and, and uh, my, you know, former lodging that I needed. You went to school for what? The government. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was my the government. But uh, it's, it, was, it was an experience. Because it, I, you take that, like I got out of 20, about, I think, 27 years old. And from that point to this point, it's been basically, you know, my decisions, doing things that, like the music, I learned, you know, how to do, handle the business side of it. As a matter of fact, I remember when you was uh, one of the uh, ghetto boys. Well, yeah, I guess I guess for all intended purposes, I guess I'm still a member. I, <laughs> I've never quite renounced my membership or yeah. denounced my membership. And, and you, I mean, you familiar with the uh, the business? You know the bumps and grinds, and it's just what people don't really realize, what the average person doesn't realize. It's not what you know. It's who you know. Because who you know can open doors for what you know. Mm. Never heard it put, put like that. But think <laughs> about it. Yeah. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. How did you get into the entertainment industry? Messing with Johnny. I was, in, I was stationed out there at Ellington Air Force Base out there. And he was living here in Houston and playing locally around these different places, him and Albert Collins mm -hmm. and Buddy Ace and Joe Hen. I used to take Joe Hen on tour. You remember Joe Hen? Hello there. What's the song? Well, hello there. Well, hello. I know the song. Yeah. Yeah. Joe Hen. Okay. And uh, Don Rover basically adopted me as his godson. He said, I'm going to make you my godson. He said, you better come to this office every day at 9 o'clock. <laughs> and, and just for those of you who are wondering who is Don Roby, uh, well, one of the baddest brothers. <laughs> well, he owned Duke, Backbeat, and Peacock Records. Yeah, yeah. One of the baddest brothers who ever walked the planet. This, is, this was a man's man. Yeah. And he was... Uh, yeah, own, Bobby Bland, uh, Bobby Bland, BB King, and stuff like that in Houston, and Big Mama Thornton. Yeah, did promotions and on you the record name label. Him. He had, all, yeah. in other words, he had all the uh, black artists across the country. Most of them, because he had all the labels. You know, and they had the uh, label in Chicago. I forget the name of that uh, guy. Can't recall these names. It's been so long, but. Mm -hmm. uh, they had uh, another black label in Chicago. And uh, they, you know. Are you talking Are you talking about Chess, chess Records? Chess. Yeah. That's it, Chess Records. Yeah. And then came uh, Bruce Igalaw with uh, Alligator. Mm hmm See, those are the two that even hound, you know, black artists, really, other than the uh, other majors, you know, but they 
was totally hell. And we playing the blues, didn't we? <laughs> you know how that go. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it, you know, it was an experience. And I was curious about everything. I wanted to know something about this. And, I, and Robert really... He opened the doors for me, you know. He, he believed in me. He covered my back. Did you ever see Roby get active? What do you mean when you say active? Like contact, make contact with somebody who violated. You know, like, because I heard a lot of stories. I'm talking about all kinds of stories of Don Roby checking people <laughs> who got out of pocket. And he would also <laughs> check artists. You know, they would say he, uh, it's one artist, I can't remember the name, but they were like, he didn't want to go on stage or something like that. And Tom was like, you're going to get your ass out there. <laughs> or they're going to, uh, something oh, else going to But see, you think like, a lot of artists is doing that era. They, you know, they didn't know. They just mm-hmm. didn't know. And uh, you think like, in business, ignorance is no excuse. And it's just that simple. You know, you invest... At that time, twenty, thirty thousand dollars was a lot of money back in the fifties. But mm-hmm. uh, if you invest these dollars, I want results. That's the only reason you invest to, to garner results. And uh, if I make any my investment and take time of my time. That should be worth something. Now, some of the people, you know, they didn't have no discretion about it. They just taking advantage of the guys because they was ignorant and had talent. Now, that w- was a part of it, too. But, hey, you know, I never looked at it that way. I looked at it, you know, if, hey, if I could benefit from it, I dealt with it. But years ago, it was... The market was totally different, and uh, a lot of there's a lot of things that you really don't discuss that took place and used entertainment at one time. You you so you 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 know exactly what I'm saying, and anybody that ever been in the entertainment business realize that hey, it's who you know, not what you know, and you be fortunate enough to get a good leader. And you got good and bad in every walk of life. So let me ask this question another way. <laughs> Did you see any situation where Don Roby had to check somebody aggressively? No. Never saw that. Okay. No. But, I, you know, ladies and gentlemen, uh, no. I just, in case you don't know, I want to remind you what a real G looks like. This guy right here. You see how he answered that? Well, you know, there's certain things that you just don't, you know, you don't talk about. You know, you know. <laughs> That's G, baby. That's G, especially in a world today where, you know, people are not just being transparent, but they do a lot of self-snitching. Well, the thing of it is this. If, uh, if I, I don't have time, to concentrate on your mistakes, unless it's in reference to, unless I'm involved, and it's in reference to something that I'm involved in. And uh, it's certain things that's cardinal sins, and it's certain things that's morally wrong. And you got to look at it, and you weigh your pros and cons. And you decide it's a price. It's a price you have to pay to win or lose. Hmm. And you have to look at it that way, and you have to remember that. If you got, and, but now I always during that era, it, you base it on uh, ignorance, but because now you understand me, people are more educated and avenues to different things are more information is more freely now and accessible you know and that's what makes the difference but uh, I never took no more than 25% 
of any deal that I ever made. But now, I know a lot of them in the industry, you understand me? They come up with slave wages. But uh, that didn't fascinate me, you know, because I treated an individual, I didn't care what he was doing. That was his personal business. He didn't want to take any risks, the chances. Only thing I tell him, don't jeopardize my situation. And that's all I was concerned about. And uh, I've been in positions where I knew a lot of things, but if uh, it's going to harm you or anybody, I keep it to myself. Because uh, well, it's, just, it's just, I don't know how you would classify it or how you would uh, look at it, but I was more concerned about my business, my welfare, and how to make it more easier for, for me and my operation, you know, what I was doing. And that took all of my time. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the way, you know, things that you know. Yeah. You don't have to discuss it. Knowledge, you understand me, and wisdom goes along with everyday life. But uh, you don't have to discuss it. Yeah. And you don't have to see a lot of people, you know, get fascinated by talking about somebody else. I look and I get fascinated by getting up in the morning, looking in the mirror, and seeing if I'm intact. And when I get through with all of that, get through with me, then it's time, you understand me, to try to generate some revenue. And it's business from that point on. I walk out of my door, boom, I'm ready to roll. Just like a, I had the time mixed up this morning. Mm -hmm. I, I thought you was, I, I was thinking it was 9.30, it was 1.30, I put I called you at 9.30. Mm -hmm. And I explained to you that, hey, my mistake. How, how do you do it, man? I, 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 I can't help but, like, like, I can't help but recognize how how well you look and how you know well you sound and and the way you get around and everything and you know most people that if you if they get to be ninety years old if they live to be ninety years old they're not as you said intact. How do you do it? What like do you have a, a secret besides just saying you know waking up every morning and saying thank you? Well, you prepare for war in time of peace, right? Mm -hmm. Most people make commitments to themselves and to others that they can't live up to. I don't. I gauge myself. I, I do the things that's beneficial to my body as well as my mind. And I take care of me. And how can I tell you that you're doing something wrong and I'm doing the same thing? And what's that's your, the way I look at it. What's your diet like? I don't have no diet. You, I eat you, whatever, so you eat whatever I choose whatever you, to eat. Whatever you choose. What is yeah. it, just in moderation or just whenever you choose? I just yeah. said it again. Is it in moderation? Do you make sure that, okay, I like, let's say, fried chicken, but I'm not going to eat it every day. Uh, I'm not going to eat too much red meat or too much drink too much coca-cola or whatever that's self-discipline yeah but that's what i do i have self-discipline i eat a variety of foods the only foods that i don't eat is shell food because i'm i'm, I'm, I'm allergic to shell food mm -hmm. but other than that i eat whatever i choose to eat but so you still eat you, you, go ahead but but i put limits on it and i know what i, I know what my intake is so anything other than that, I have to investigate. You know, I have to check it out. I don't experiment with me. So do you eat fried foods? You eat fried foods? Yeah, I, fried eat, foods I, eat, all, I eat, eat all kinds of food other than shell food. Yeah. How often do you eat fried foods? Whenever you feel like it. Well, yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Now, now, how often do you do you get checkups? Yeah, Regular every six months. Every six months. Yeah. Every six months, I go to the get me a checkup. Have, 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 they, have they ever discovered something and you had to, you know, they caught it early enough for you to fight it and and beat it? They, no, they, the only only uh. No, I never, I never really had no what you would call a, a serious element. Mm -hmm. Thus far, I never had it. You know, like uh, when this uh, Corona, COVID. Well, I went to the hospital twice. Stayed four days the first time and three days the next time. But uh, so it was pretty bad. Yeah, from that point. That's the only real sickness that I ever had. Mm -hmm. um, so, I'm 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 always curious when I when I interview my elders and when I talk to guys who are where I want to be, and uh, I always find it um, I find it uh, you know I guess uh, fascinating that. You can uh, you get to be a, you know a certain age where you've lived and seen certain things and and your body changes and that's part of growth you know like your body changes you know your friends changes you know uh, people are born but oftentimes you know people are dying your peers die family members die and things like that you know uh, as you get older and 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 you see you experience all of these people that you've known uh, that, you know, uh, transition, you know, does it, does it weigh on you? Is it like a burden? Uh, is it something that you think about often or do you just like, hey, well, you, know? you, you deal with reality. Mm -hmm. And the certain things are automatic. Birth and death. Those things are going to happen. And uh, everybody look forward to going to heaven, but don't nobody want to die. And that's the way you have to look at it. And you have to adjust and sacrifice and make accordingly. You know, if you're eating all these, well, you know when you're eating out of sink and and uh, what your, your intake, what your intake is and what it's not. What's, you know what's good to you and what's not good to you. And good, same, just and vice versa would have for you, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, you just have to make sacrifices. Everything you want, that don't mean you have to have, or that it's good for you. And that's what you got to look at. And things that are proven not good for me, I don't mess with those. I don't eat chill food because it. Swells me up. I'd be in a room, Chinese restaurants, and they, if back if I'm in a, where the circulation is bad, my allergies start messing with me. You know, so it's just certain things you just don't do, and it's certain things you have to do. But you keep those down to a minimum if you can. If you can't. You learn to deal with it. And I've been fortunate enough to be healthy, but I take care of my body. I don't drink no alcohol. I drink, the last time I had a drink was 60 years ago. How long? 60. 60? Wow. The last time I smoked a cigarette was 55 years ago. Okay. No smoking, no drinking. No smoking, no drinking. Okay. And uh, I did that on my own. And I did that because the things that uh, I was doing to make these things happen wasn't in agreement with me. And I had to make stop doing it. I just one day I just I I, I got I got drunk. My partners dropped me off at home in Gary and Anna. Ice on the ground. I, I, as soon as I got out of the car, I fell. I couldn't get up. I had to crawl to my front door. 
Every time I get up, I fall down. I'm drunk on that ice. Mm -hmm. You know, and you you can figure the ice and snow, and you're trying to walk drunk, and you can mm -hmm. imagine we that. Did. And mm -hmm. uh, my sister had to come to the door and help me in the house. And I was so embarrassed that I promised myself I'd never drink again. You know, that's one thing about you, man. You know, you've always been a proud dude, an honorable dude. You know, that's why I still deal with you. <laughs> I rock with you because of that, man. You know, you've always been an honorable man. You know, like, like, and, uh, you know, I've met a, a lot, a lot of men, you know, but it ain't too many that really just stand for something. You got guys that'll stand on something, but yeah, they don't stand, don't stand for, for something. anything, yeah. right? And you that type of dude, bro. Like you are, you are a man's man. Um, Thank you. <laughs> let's go back to James Brown playing basketball. I mean, I got mm -hmm. Marvin Gaye because I used to hear stories about Marvin Gaye playing basketball, mm -hmm. but I never right. heard a story about <laughs> James Brown playing basketball. Did, oh, man, did he yeah. play in tennis shoes or did he have his platforms on? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, tennis shoes. <laughs> It's hard, for me, it's hard for me to picture James Brown and, uh, playing basketball. You know, you know, one of our favorite places was the the uh, the, the Miller Theater in in Austin. Yeah, on yeah. 12th Street. That, yeah. that 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 what was it? Oh man, I can't think of the name of that, that gym right over there. It's old. I don't know if they still that now. Or not I'm quite sure it's not though. That's years. Ago. Oh man, this was. Whew, shit, I can't remember how long that Yeah, man. that was before me. But uh, I used to, we used to go up there and play a lot. When he'd come to town, see, other words, my position with Don Rover was to pick the acts up in Kansas City or St. Louis and bring them through the Southwest. And I forget the name of the promoter that would pick them up in after Amarillo and come on out west. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would do. And you take like uh, Tina Turner, I, we all knew each other, we was real cool, you know, we could hang out together and everything. And you take like Etta James, personal friend of mine, all these guys, you know, I know them all, Otis Reddy, Otis had, Otis, you know, he was on tour when he when he had to crash. You know, when they when they crashed and killed, mm -hmm. got killed. But he had played the three weeks before then had to play the ballroom for us. And you remember? I don't know whether you remember Bob Garner. Everybody called him Bob G. Not for me. Russo, you remember Russo? Remember Russo. Russo, you talking about the, the yeah, promoter? but him and yeah, the promoter. Yeah. Well, him and Don Rover was partners mm -hmm. in promotion, and they used to pick up all the action coming to the south, south and southwest. And we'd pick them up and camp through the south and southwest, and then another promoter would pick them up and take them on out west, California and Nevada and all up there in that area. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the way I got me here, every major artist in the country. At that time, I knew him personally. Cause we, you know, as you take like, well, you name them. I can't even remember all the names of them, you know. That uh, we just like one family. Hmm. Well, when you get to all of those big names, like like some of the names that you you've been affiliated with, then I know everybody else. You got them and everything in between. You've mentioned Ike and Tina. Ike and Tina, you seen the movie, uh, What's Love Got to Do With It? Uh -huh. How accurate was that movie? Pretty accurate. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Pretty accurate. And uh, I leave it at that. Mm. You know, because uh, I had a lot of respect for both of them. But lifestyles make differences. And that's the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You 
mention also Etta James, the great. Oh, yeah. All, yeah. Of, all of these people are great, but, you know, Etta James was, like, really, and all of them all of them were in their own lane, but oh, yeah. it was something about Etta James that was, like. Well, Etta was her own self-person. Yeah. And uh, I guess that's what it was. Yeah. She well, was she, a rebel. Yeah, she, and, 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 and she would tell you real quick, say, I show up at the time that I'm supposed to be there. I'm on the stage at the time that I'm supposed to be there. I give you 100% when I'm on that stage, while I'm on that stage. Say, but as far as my life and my livelihood is concerned, that doesn't come under the heading of your business. And that's the way she was. Do you remember where, where, where you were when you got the news that she passed? Not really. No, not really. Did you I, know Joe Jackson? Yeah. Stayed two blocks from Joe Jackson. Yeah. And Michael and my, my kids went to school with Michael and all of Yeah. Yeah, Bernard. You know Bernard. Yeah. My son. Yeah, I know Bernard. When, when everything took off, uh, like, and they really blew up, that, were y'all able to continue to stay connected after that? Yeah, I, I, with Joe, you know, the kids, the youngsters, and you know, they so for the difference behind us, you know, they didn't really uh, Michael and uh, uh, Janet and what's the other one? Tito, Jermaine, Tito, Jermaine, Marlon, all that. Well, uh, see, we stayed. On 22nd and Adams. They stayed on 23rd and Jackson. And the streets are made uh, from the uh, old, you know, presidents, you know. And the pres so, they, so you see that in that order. Mm. It was two by three blocks. And, uh, yeah, you see Joe every day. Joe, Joe was a heck of a guy. Man, you and Joe kind of fable, though, man. I've been looking at, I'm sitting up here looking at you. That's why I ask you about you. And you obviously because you're from Gary, Indiana, but you and Joe kind of fable. You, man, you sure y'all ain't re related? No, 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 no. Not that I know. Turner Jackson. Turner Jackson sounds like a company. But Turner as far as my kids are concerned, they all was raised up together with, with uh, the Jackson Five, you know? Yeah. All of them, because they had stayed right around the corner. Went to the same school and everything. Do you remember it once they blew up, what that did to the neighborhood and Gary in general, the kind of pride that it brought to the city? Well, not really. Gary was always was a popular city. It's, in other words, it's 19 miles out of Chicago. So you figure from that point, and it's right in the middle of everything. Mm hmm so you figure from that point, it was, it was otherwise it's just a, a wild city, you know. It just, it was a beautiful place to live. But uh, I don't know what happened down through the years. But I went through there about three years ago, and uh, the city just gone. It's gone. The government brought crack cocaine into the neighborhoods and then it spread it. That's what happened. It's gone. Yeah. I'm talking about it's non existent. I was looking at, I was, tears got in my eyes. I looked at the place where I was raised up at the house. Said one time, my family owned that whole block, 22nd to 23rd. And uh, I went back there about three years ago. And the place where I was raised up at the house that I was raised up in, a tree had grown up through the middle of through the roof of it. <laughs> and is it is the house still operable? Is somebody no, living there? No, no, no. It's the whole town. Because, uh, you know, I said it because, you know, you got people that have little projects like that. You know no. what? I'm going to give me a house with, the, with a tree, a real but tree. The, uh, but this tree goes straight up through the, 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 the living room of the, of the house. I got mm -hmm. And I just, you know, it brings a lot of thoughts back to you when you see things like this, you know. Yeah. And uh, I was really disappointed. 
and myself for going. I, I shouldn't even went over there and put that pressure on myself because I already had read and heard and talked to different people. And uh, the mayor at one time was my personal friend. We was in school together, Rudy Clay. He was the mayor. And uh, you take like, that's the way I met uh, President Obama. Through Rudy, him and Rudy was good friends. He was in Chicago. Rudy was the mayor of Gary and Anna. That's right across the street. Man, I, 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 don't, I had no idea that Gary was that close to Chicago. Yeah. I should have known this. Damn, I've played all of these cities. I've been in all yeah, you've been I've all of them. I've played all of these cities. It's I should, have, I should know that. It's, in actuality, it's 17 miles. From Gary to the state line, Illinois state line. This is worth a brief research moment. <laughs> Gary, Indiana, distance to Chicago. Boom. It says 30 miles, but that's still close as hell. It ain't, it ain't 30 miles. Maybe they talk, they're talking about downtown to downtown. Down, yeah, well, downtown yeah, that's to down, down, down to downtown. Uh, but well, yeah, you don't have a downtown yeah. no more. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's, it's bad. But you know what? It's going to come back. I, I, I feel it. I oh, think, it's got to come back. I think, I think it'll come back. It's because, got to come back. You know, all it's going to take is... is, is people to start, like, building over there. And it's, well, it's, what they're going to do... It once you, if you, you ever know, notice you know, gentrified how neighborhoods are directed now, you notice around the country, even here, we buy homes and we set up communities and then we turn around twenty years later it's destroyed because they can't afford to keep them up. So you repurchase the same property and sell it all over again. <laughs> yeah, and repurchase at a cut rate. Yeah, at a yeah. cut rate. And, and then repurchase and then sell it all raise over Raise the again. taxes and sell it all over again, yeah. See, and that's, called, and, and, uh, that's what we call corporate America. Hmm. Man, what was it like being very good friends with Muhammad Ali? Oh, ever, man. Never seen anybody like him before. Yeah. He's a different kind of person, period. Different kind of, he's a different breed. He the only, he, he the only individual that I ever met that had most confidence in himself than I have in myself. Mm-hmm. He tell you in a minute, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. But for there's one thing I respected about him and I learned from him. Don't make no commitments unless you intend on fulfillment. Mm -hmm. He remind us a lot of times, say, hey, we, what, what happened to that deal? We so busy, you understand me, trying to get all the, everything together. But uh, he always liked to witness things. He, a lot of times he wouldn't say nothing, he just looked. But uh, he tell me or uh, one of the uh, other Boudina wanna say, uh, I don't wanna go back there no more. Yeah. H how did you meet Muhammad Ali? Through Boudini. Boudini, and how did that happen? Well, me and Boudini knew each other real well in New York. We used to hang out together every day. And uh, Ali was living in Houston at the time, I think. And that's during the, you know, the, when he had, was having his problems. Yeah, when he was you know, fighting that uh, yeah. the draft. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I was there, you understand me, when he, when they did that movie and everything on that. What, didn't they film that in Houston? Yeah, they had to call Sim. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a different kind of person. You know, he's hard to describe Ali because uh, he's straightforward. He couldn't keep ice water. 
<laughs> if it was on, if it was on his mind, it came out of his mouth. You seen Ali at different stages of his success. Did you ever see him switch it up? As far as like his the type of person he is, he had different type of energy depending on how how successful he was. Did you ever see him switch up at all? Mm-mm. Sorry. He always been the type of individual. What he said is what he do and what he believe in. And he'll sacrifice all of it for that. That's the kind of person he was. It's known it's not a secret that it was people that wanted Ali dead. You was never afraid when you were hanging out with Ali and mm-hmm. being in places with Ali. You wasn't uh, ever like concerned about being targeted. No. Because uh, a lot of it's fiction. You know, once you get to know the guy, he don't hurt anybody but himself. If any hurt at all, he the one that I seen when they took the Tyler away from him and barred him from boxing. He the one I seen and walking around with patches in his shoes. Baseball in his shoes because he couldn't afford to get them fixed. And he would tell me, and he'd tell all of me at Boudini, we'd be together damn every day. He said, I'm going to win this, this uh, conflict that they got here. So I'm not going to the penitentiary. Said, I'm not. He told them when they drafted him he wasn't going. Soon as he they drafted him, he told me he wasn't going, and he stuck to that all the way to down the road. They they understand me had to compensate. He didn't. He said no. He said before I do it, so I lose everything. So I don't want. I'm not going, and it's just that simple. Don't ask me no more. Don't even mention it to me no more. He told all of us that. <laughs> How much time had elapsed between the time that they stripped him of his title and when he was able to finally go back into the ring? About three years. It was about three years, right? Yeah, about three years. So so what did y'all do? What were y'all doing to make time pass by? What was Ali doing in in, in those three years? Well, How was the, he keeping himself busy? Well, the, the, uh, well you know he's a Muslim. And they looked out for him, you know. They looked out for him. Otherwise, he had a place to stay, but he didn't have the excesses that he used to have. But he had a place to stay. He had His upkeep was there. Mm-hmm. Put it that way. His upkeep was there. And uh, Ali was his own self-man. If he liked it, he liked it. If he didn't, he didn't. It's just that simple. Mm-hmm. He wasn't hard to figure out. He, and just like when we really got close was when uh, his uh, Boudin's son was supposed to go back to college. And uh, me and Boudin were together. I And uh, Boudin started crying, sitting at my house in New York. He started crying. I said, what's wrong with you, man? He said, I said, Drew Jr. got to go, just like on a Friday. He said, Drew Jr. got to go to college Monday. And I need $1,700 and the champ ain't got no money. I gave him $1,800 and told him to go pay the, for the boy to go to school. He told Ali. Ali told him to tell me to come by there. He's over in Paris, New Jersey. Told him to tell me to come by there. And he told me, said, me and Boudini. He said, whatever way I can repay you for looking out for my man, so I'll do it. So I'm going to so win this trial, this court thing. So I'm going to beat the Navy, the Army, the Marines, and the Air Force. <laughs> Mm-hmm. That's just the way he said it. And uh, I'm going to be a world champion again. He said, and I appreciate what you do. Say, whatever you, what do you want to do when I be, to be world, when I get back? 
I said, well, he said, you can be my promoter. I said, no. I said, I don't know about the promoter. I said, because that's too big for me. I just want you to understand it's too big for me. I don't think I could handle it. I said, and me and uh, Pudini said, well, you know Don. I said, yeah, I know Don King. I said, now that would be the man. I said, he know. So you in, you introduced our leader, Don King, or you just suggested I, that he go to him? I suggested it. Yeah. I didn't introduce him, but I knew Don mm -hmm. in Cleveland. See, I knew And uh, Don knew that business. And he's the perfect guy for it because uh, he's outspoken, he's intelligent, and it's, it's pretty hard, you understand me, to surmise him, you know. He he one of a kind. <laughs> Just like Ali, one of a kind. And they hit it they hit it off just like that. Boom. Boudini introduced him to him. And that, that during this time Ali was was walking around with Pants in his shoes, couldn't get his shoes half sold. His feet was on the ground. So he had cardboard in his shoes. Wow. And he told me, he said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I might well do the concessions and the uh, souvenir programs. He said, okay. I said, you got it. And when he uh, got exonerated, Boudini called me. He told Boudini to call me. He said, I told you I was going to win. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the way to the call. Ali was one of those type of guys that it's hard to go against. A lot like you. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're the type of guy that it's not a good idea to bet against because it's something about your drive. It's something that's in you that say, I'm going to get it done. Like, if you want to do something once you put your mind to something. I do it. <laughs> it's done. Like, yeah. I, and I've witnessed that time and time and time and time again. And I guess that's why I respect you so much. That's why I respect that I lead so much. I respect men who are built like that. And that's why I carry myself like that. When you say say something, if you say you're going to do something, stick to it, do it. Do it. That's me. Always See, time that is the essence. That's what people, time, people, people don't realize they're sending me the importance of time. And, but you take, you know, just like, okay, just like this morning, I was, I was wrong. Because I'm downstairs waiting on you at 930. Because uh, I, that was in my yeah. mind, 9.30. And at 9.34, I called you. You said, no. I said, we supposed to meet at one thirty. I said, okay. Well, at one thirty, yeah. <laughs> I was standing there in that lobby. Well, they say if you're early, you're not late. You can't be late. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If you're early, you can't be late. No. And to me, you understand me, time is money. I'm not going to waste yours, and I'm not going to let you waste mine. And it's just, just, just bottom line. Well, and uh, that's the way I look at it. That's the way I think. And I don't ask no more out of any individual that I'm willing to put into an individual. Hmm. I want to ask you about one other thing before I let you go. Um, one other person, Natalie Cole. Right. <laughs> Na Natalie Cole was like, man, something different to me. Like she was, like from what I saw on the album covers, her angelic voice, you know, she was beautiful, she was classy. You know, she was the it girl. I don't know anybody who's ever known Natalie Cole and looked at her or whatever and said, you know, nah, pass, uh-uh, Natalie Cole was like, Natalie Cole is royalty, right? And uh, I remember that was uh, at a point in our life that she was on drugs and she was like out there really, really bad. And um, that was a, uh, at, at one point, uh, the guy who introduced her to that, 
Did you know that guy? Mm-mm. You know, no, I never really knew him. Okay, him. yeah, but that uh, do you? But you knew her during that time. Yeah, that time period. Mm, I knew her. And, yeah, they had known her. Did, did remember, you? Did, did remember you? Remember, I'm ninety years old. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> but did, but did, did you? Did you ever try to like when you found out what was going on? Did you ever try to step in or whatever, or just get some information or whatever? No. Yeah. Why not? Well. I learned when I was a kid, take care of your own business. And it takes all of your time to keep yourself in check with your, in tune with you, to be able to what make you think you qualify to judge another individual. Mm. You have to qualify. Yeah. And but I'm not necessarily talking about judging. I'm just talking about like offering some assistance to get off those drugs get out of that situation no see the big, the worst thing you can do is tell a, a drug head that they shouldn't be taking drugs so you just thought that if you say something it'd just be a waste of time yeah you're wasting time because the bottom line is drugs is a weapon itself and if an individual doesn't build his resistance up to dismiss itself from drugs, it's not gonna happen. You the one that's got to say, well, hey, I'm done, I'm through. And I know you understand me, you can do it because I done it myself as far as alcohol and cigarettes was concerned. Anything that's habit forming is a hazard. Hmm. And you have to remember that. And when you catch yourself, you understand me, in, in that position, you got to hurry up and correct that. And it takes all of your leisure time to dissect you. And if you concentrate on dissecting you and being fair to people that's fair to you, or, or eliminating the ones you understand me that you don't necessarily need in your life, You'd be the judge of that. You don't know somebody that can judge that. And just like you understand me, your wife, your girlfriend, when you lie to your woman or your friend, you're lying to yourself. Because if you got to lie to your friend or your woman, something wrong. Hmm. Think about it. Because lies come back to haunt you, and then you have to remember them. I don't have to remember nothing I say. Because what I said is what I thought at that time. And that's what I did. So now, if it turned out to be wrong, I charge it to my head, not my heart. And leave it at that. That's the biggest sacrifice I had to make. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert T. Turner. He's a legend. Mm -hmm. And I ain't got to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming on the show, man. Hey, I, mean, I enjoyed it. Absolutely. Yeah, hey, I like this. <laughs> it's been a long time. It's been a long it, time. It brings back a lot of memories. Yeah, yeah. And then you and I go way back. You yeah. know, we go. I was surprised when you called me. What was it? How so? Uh, Why were you surprised? I didn't, I didn't know that. See, I had changed numbers. And I didn't know that you had the uh, new number. Man, you know I'm going to find you, man. No matter what yeah. happened, man. You know I'm going to find you. You can't yeah. run. You like to move around. You still be moving around, man. Well, you don't just move around with your, your body. <laughs> you move around from the places that you live. Like, a lot of times people get to be a certain age, man. They just say, okay, this is where I'm going to... This the house that I'm going to uh, die in or I'm going to live here for the next 30, 50 years or whatever. 10, 20, 30 years. Now, now you, will move to, you will move tomorrow. <laughs> like, if, hey. if you don't, if you ain't feeling it, if I don't you think it's time it, for change, you out. Well, I put pressure on myself. Yeah. And when you do things, you understand me, beyond your thinking, then you're putting pressure on yourself. Yeah. So why do that? To me, that's not smart. Oh, intelligence. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen.
Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Robert T. No more talk. Yeah. Thank you.